everyone. Welcome to the Wallingford Public Library. My name is Julie Rio. I'm the Adult Programming and Community Services Librarian here. Welcome to the golden age of horror films of the 1930s and 1940s. And today we are so lucky to have with us Leon DiMartino, who teaches history and folk tales at Mount St. Mary College in Newburgh, New York, and Westchester Community College, also in New York. Uh, he's an experienced presenter on many, many topics. Uh, he has a master's degree in history and education from Fordham University. So please join me in giving a warm Wallingford welcome to Leon DiMartino. Well, this, this is a wonderful group this morning, and uh, this is going to be an interesting presentation. Uh, the Golden Age of Hollywood Horror Films from the 30s to the 40s. Now, uh, what makes that unique? Well, you know, we've had film and horror films from the 1890s onward. And between the 1890s and 1920s, it pays to know what happens ahead uh, of what we're going to talk about. Uh, what had happened was uh, the silent film was king. And there were a lot of horror films that were silent films. But what happens in the 30s, the late 20s into the 30s, is that they add sound to movies and sound opens up a whole new way of dealing with film and especially horror films. You could do things like uh, uh, piercing screams, creaking doors, echoing footsteps, the rumbling of thunder near castle walls and that adds a new level of excitement to a horror film. You know, prior to that all you would see is people running around on screen and you would see little cue cards where the dialogue should be. But now you could actually listen to sounds of things going on in the background of a film and you could also listen to the actors. And what happens is in the 30s and 40s a whole new core of horror film actors come around too. Um, you have people such as uh, Boris Karloff who speaks with almost a Shakespearean uh, dialogue, a way of speaking, same maybe with a Vincent Price. You have a sinister character like Peter Lorre, who has that sort of repressive and very sinister voice. Um, you have a person with a foreign accent, such as Abella Lagosi, you know, who adds another level of interest to those movies. So, in the 30s and in the 40s, uh, whole series of wonderful uh, movies and horror films. And an example, Boris Karloff, Elsa Lancaster, you know, A Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, not only great uh, sounds and dialogue, but uh, incredible makeup and uh, storylines. What happens is when they become popular first in the 30s, you're going to start with gothic themes. And those would be things like Frankenstein comes out of the Mary Shelley uh, book of that name. Uh, other famous authors who are going to contribute to it uh, would be people such as Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote a lot of those types of tales, short stories. And uh, other folks you could think of. Now, you probably wouldn't think of this, but um, uh, the gentleman who wrote uh, uh, Treasure Island and Kidnapped, Robert Louis Stevenson, he wrote a couple of interesting horror stories. The Body Snatchers is one, and that's based on a real tale in Scotland, which I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. And the other one, which is an incredible story, is the uh, strange uh, tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, it deals with a, not only a, a monster theme, but it's also a split personality. And he wrote that uh, quite a few years before Sigmund Freud did psychoanalysis. So it's interesting to see how these tales develop. And then after the Gothic tales, we're going to go into other variations of uh, horror tales, you know, uh, which in turn sometimes take a Gothic tale and give it a different twist. You could look at comedy. You might even look at a musical horror film, and it's one of those too. 
And in the 30s and 40s, there was a, actually a musical horror film way before the Rocky Horror Show and way before Young Frankenstein with the uh, remember the dance routine putting on the Ritz, you know, and the Young Frankenstein. Well, in the 40s, uh, you had your first uh, musical uh, horror film as well. Now, uh, Hollywood not only added sound to these horror movies, but also created the great horror movie posters as well. During that era, the posters were as great as the movies, you know, when you went by a theater, and in those days everybody went to the theater, you know, there would be a Saturday evening uh, film, you know, uh, uh, some of people's first dating experiences, you know, would have been going to those movies on a horror weekend or something. And uh, the posters were very, very attractive. They, they also encouraged people. You know, if you were uh, during the week walking past the theater and you saw one of these coming soon posters, uh, they tend to bring people into the theaters and uh, show an, an idea of what's to come. Uh, one of the most famous of the Hollywood actors, Bela Lugosi, the one with the foreign accent, uh, he was born um, Bela Frinak uh, Glasgow on October 20th, 1882, and Lugos Austria-Hungary, the Austrian-Hungary Empire, you know, long before World War I. And he dies on August 16, 1956, in Los Angeles, California, at age 73. And of course, the cause of death was a heart attack. Uh, he was an actor, and of course, his most memorable uh, role was Count Dracula in a series of Universal Studios movies. He also appeared briefly in uh, the Edward movie Escape from Planet Nine, which is considered one of the worst movies. Uh, and the way they usually advertise it is it was so bad it was good. <laughs> you know, and uh, if you ever want to uh, see something that's interesting, if you get an opportunity, uh, although the, the Planet Nine is from a later time, the 50s, uh, I'm sure your library has a copy of that. And that would be a wonderful film. Uh, Ed Wood uh, stars um, uh, Johnny Depp and uh, Martin Landau, who most people will remember from those Mission Impossible series on TV. Well, Marty Landau, uh, who was a great actor and uh, also uh, great with makeup and creating characters, uh, actually creates Bella Lugosi in the Ed Wood movie. And his uh, rendition of what uh, Bella would have looked like is so realistic that I was starting to believe he was actually Bella Lugosi. He, and he actually wins an Academy Award uh, for his presentation in the Edward movie. But the real Bella Lugosi, this is what he looked like, and he did talk with a foreign accent. He starts in the 1920s uh, acting in movies, and prior to that he was doing stage work uh, in, uh, Eastern Europe, and what today would probably be Romania. Uh, now, fascinating character. Uh, a little bit more on his background. You know, there are things that people don't know which make it more interesting. He becomes a success with Dracula in 1931. Now, that wasn't the first Dracula movie. It was actually a silent Dracula movie done in the 20s. It was called Nest for Two. And what happened there was uh, there was a tremendous lawsuit in Europe uh, brought by the widow of Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker was the gentleman, uh, the Anglo-English author who wrote um, Dracula. And uh, what they did was a German uh, studio, Prana Films, uh, created Nest for Two. They drew heavily on the Dracula novel but they never compensated the widow. So a big lawsuit in the early 20s. And what happens is that uh, nobody would dare tackle another Dracula movie until the 30s. And the first one they uh, made, and there have been many, many after this, uh, was in 1931. And Bela Lugosi fit the bill. He became the classic Dracula that we know today. 
uh, he looked debonair, he looked foreign, and uh, he created sort of this image on screen, of sort of a romantic image too, which is so much different than the German film in the uh, silent era, the Nesfetur, where the character was more hideous, you know, long fingernails, pointed ears, uh, dark, sort of foreboding character. This one had, uh, when it came out, a certain amount of romance to them. And uh, ladies, even though they were terrified, would have also been uh, perhaps enamored of a more suave or sophisticated Dracula. Okay, sometimes the equipment goes down. Let's just do this. Now the Dracula movie itself, Dracula. A moment ago, I stumbled upon a most amazing phenomenon. Something so incredible, Vampires have no image in I mistrust my own judgment. Look. Dracula. The very mention of the name brings to mind things so evil, so fantastic, so degrading. You wonder if it isn't all a dream, a nightmare. Rats. 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 Thousands. Millions of them. But no, this is no dream. This is Dracula, the original terrifying story of a maniac. And a man who lived after death, lived on human blood, took the form of a vampire bat, and lured innocent girls to a fate truly worse than death. Dracula! What? What's he done to you, Dick? Tell me. He came to me. He opened his bed in his arms, and he made me drink. Now, uh, the original Dracula movie uh, was such a sensation for Universal in 1931 that they followed it up with a Frankenstein film. So they not only drew on Bram Stoker's Gothic novel, but then they go to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and they develop that as a second character. Now, what most people don't know is that Bela Lugosi was supposed to be up for the role of Frankenstein. And he refused it. You know, he was a big Hollywood star after that Dracula 1931 film. And he felt it was be beneath him to have to spend all that time uh, in a uh, studio putting on all that makeup. You know, this the high shoes, there's the bolts in the neck, the long head, you know, extended brow. Uh, but Lugosi said no, you know, he wanted to be more of a sophisticated character as the Dracula, you know, with Devonair dressed well, you know. And uh, so what happens is this uh, English actor, uh, Boris Karloff, uh, who was glad to have any acting job, and a very uh, amiable type individual, as opposed to Bella Lugosi, who was more of a uh, high-strung personality. Uh, so what happens is uh, Universal Studios offers uh, Boris Karloff that role and he was glad to have the job, he took it. And not knowing that that would become his bigger sensation as Bela Lugosi's Dracula. So you had these two um, horror stars uh, making the beginnings of a, a great classic career for each starting in the uh, 30s. Now what's interesting about it is that uh, we refer to them as uh, friendly rivals. Now, a lot of the uh, movies that uh, they did for Universal involved uh, topics such as, well, uh, The Black Cat and The Raven, 
uh, are both uh, based on Edgar Allan Poe short stories, also sort of a gothic uh, background. Uh, Black Friday and Invisible Ray were later movies uh, based more on science fiction horror. The Son of Frankenstein, a follow-up to the Frankenstein movie, uh, and they also appeared uh, in two RKO films together, uh, You Will Find Out and The Body Snatcher, which we'll talk about later. Body Snatcher is actually based on uh, a, uh, uh, a Robert Louis Stevenson novel and a real case that happened in Scotland. So we'll get to that as we continue. But they were friendly rivals throughout their life. And as Karloff's star started to rise, Bella Lugosi's star started to go into decline. And uh, one of the things that actors can be so petty with is that uh, billing on the movie poster, you know, who has top billing becomes an issue. Bella was very much, he wanted top billing here regardless. Karloff didn't mind second billing as long as he got paid. You know, and one wonderful thing about Karloff uh, who had a little more of an extended career, is that he said, you know, this thing is not going to last forever. I might as well enjoy it while it's here. And that was his philosophy and his approach uh, to making our films. He became a classic addict. Uh, Universal, which was one of the first progressive studios in horror films, also did other types of horror films between 30, 1933 and 35. Uh, the Frankenstein movie was such a hit that they did a follow-up with Bride of Frankenstein. And uh, this is what happens. If they have a hit with one movie, there might be three or four renditions of follow-ups. You know, there could be a son of somebody, there could be a daughter of the daughter of the vampire, or son of Frankenstein. You know, they got through everything except cousins. <laughs> but <laughs> in any case, that was a standard way that Universal would uh, do follow-up movies. It also gave the actors additional work. So the Karloffs and the Lugosi's and the Peter Lorries and later on Vincent Price would love uh, the follow-up movies. King Kong was an interesting twist, a little bit different a savage beast that becomes a horror film. And uh, it was a uh, twist away from the Gothic, the traditional Gothic of the Frankenstein and Dracula movies. And of course, Faye Ray with that scene uh, on top of the Empire State Building. It's still to this day a classic. Okay. There's of course the picture of Faye Ray that we'll always remember. Uh, a little bit about Faye Ray. She was born uh, Vina Faye Ray on September 15, 1907 in Alberta, Canada. And she dies on August 6, uh, 2004 at age 96. So she lived a very healthy age in New York City. That's where she passes away. A professional Hollywood actress from 1933 to 1980 and was forever known for the 1933 King Kong movie. Now, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein novel uh, goes on, uh, and there's other movies also. Uh, Frankenstein and the Mad Monster. And uh, this becomes another release on November 21st of 1931. Uh, it deals with a mad scientist, and that's an interesting twist. Mad scientist, you know. Mad scientist will become a theme in later movies. Even when they get away from Frankenstein, they will still keep a mad scientist as a theme for many of these horror movies. Uh, it not only uh, proved to be profitable for the studios um, after the release, but it generated a whole new series of movies based upon the original uh, monster or character. And interesting enough, uh, in 1991, uh, this particular film uh, was uh, uh, made part of the uh, Library of Preservation, the National Historic Register. It means this film will be preserved for all times 
so that future generations can watch it. Uh, it reflects uh, movie making of that era. Uh, one of the things they've had trouble with is prior to the federal government getting in uh, through the law of <coughs> Congress and the National Film Registry uh, to the business was that uh, at times uh, the films would decay in the uh, canisters or the holders because they were nitrate based and many of the old uh, 1920s silent movies are no longer around. You know, great performances by uh, people that uh, you can't even imagine how good the movies were. Uh, the only thing you have is pictures or outtakes from the movies, but the films are pretty much destroyed. So any film that's preserved by the federal government will be there for all times, and it's a great thing that they do that. They do it not just for horror movies, but for all types of movies. Now, Boris Karloff is Frankenstein. Uh, a lot involved. Interesting the way he played the character. Like I said, he had that quality of a Shakespearean actor in Englishman. And what he does with it is he plays the Frankenstein monster uh, with a little bit of compassion. You know, he's a twisted soul, uh, but he has a nice side to him. He looks at plants, he looks at flowers, he looks at trees. There's a scene in the movie where he's talking with a little girl. He's there with a blind man. So he plays uh, the Frankenstein monster not as a horrible, uh, vicious creature, but as a soul who's been wronged uh, by a mad scientist's experiment. And uh, he uh, sort of doesn't know what to do with himself. Now, from the Frankenstein movie trailer, 1969 in Sussex, England. He was a professional actor between 1909 and 1969. He migrates from London to Canada and then from Canada to Hollywood and becomes a Hollywood classic. And of course his most memorable roles will include uh, Frankenstein and the Mummy. Uh, similar to Martin Landau of a later generation, uh, this gentleman was a uh, wizard with Hollywood makeup and uh, portraying characters on the screen. The Mummy, which is uh, released by Universal Studios on December 22, 1932, tells the story of an ancient Egyptian mummy discovered by archaeologists and brought back to life through the use of an ancient scroll. Now, this is fascinating because it doesn't have a Gothic theme. But what's interesting about it is uh, it's kind of a hyped up version of something that happened in the 1920s. Uh, you remember the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun? You know? Uh, the curse of the mummy. The idea that a mummy can uh, come back to life and seek revenge. Well, uh, if you know anything about the 1920s uh, of discovery, uh, there's some parts of that, they took the story, did a little bit of a twist with it, and created it as a horror film. This is uh, two uh, of the makeup uh, uh, jobs that the studio, Universal, did with Boris Kohler. One is the original Mummy, which is on your right, and the other is the mummy brought back to life, you know. And you could see uh, some similarity, but big differences. Now, let's see if this works nice. I think you might enjoy it if we can get it. Death, eternal. 
capital punishment for anyone who opens this casket. The mummy. Is it dead or alive? Human or inhuman? You'll know. You'll see. You'll feel the awful, creeping, crawling terror that stands your hair on end and brings a scream to your lips. There's nothing on earth like the mummy. You will not remember what I show you now, and yet I shall awaken memories Love the voice. of love and crime and death. Now I know his horrible plan. He is going to kill her and make her a living mummy like himself. The actual event that they kind of twisted around and took the story was uh, Howard Carter's uh, finds and uh, uncovering of a tomb that uh, King Tutankhamun on uh, November 22, 1922 in Egypt. Uh, a real life uh, news story as the inspiration for the horror movie. Uh, one of the things that they talked about in the 30s was that everybody that was associated with this archaeological dig in Egypt uh, died within a short time. And that's where the idea came up of a curse of a mummy. Something about the tomb, you broke into the tomb and therefore uh, evil would uh, follow you and you would uh, come through a untimely demise. What they found out in reality is the reason why all of those people who were involved in the archaeological dig had died so early on was because when they dug into the tomb there was all kinds of bacteria in there and they were breathing it within the air within the tomb and that's what actually caused the diseases that finally took the lives of many of them so uh, you know if a tomb was sealed for 3,700 Years. Obviously, uh, when a person's body decomposes, there is some kind of uh, bacterial uh, spores that would grow within the tomb. And people didn't know that. The science wasn't that advanced in the 20s. But this is a, uh, a picture of uh, Howard Carter actually opening to the Commons uh, casket and preparing to take notice on it. The Invisible Man. Okay, so we went from gothic novels to taking a horror story out of a news uh, paper uh, story about an archaeological dig. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to a, a science fiction sort of gothic tale. And this is another variation on the horror movie. Uh, we no longer have Frankenstein, but we have a mad scientist who, through a uh, series of uh, experiments, uh, makes his body invisible. And this is based on an H.G. Wells novel. And uh, the film uh, was uh, released on uh, November 13th, 1933, with a film running time of 70 minutes. Uh, it starred Claude Renz and Gloria Stewart. Uh, the basic plot was that a doctor, a chemist, discovers a formula that makes him invisible with unexpected results. Let's see if we can get the film on this one. Last night, I thought he was in desperate trouble. He meddled in things men should leave alone. Not the slightest clue. That 
that's where the clues are. He wasn't leaving anything to chance. There must be a way back. <laughs> Theater, film, and was a television actress, 
and she was also married to Charles Lloyd uh, from 1929 to 1962 when he passes on. Uh, Charles Lloyd, you probably remember the Hunchback of Notre Dame among other things. Uh, he also did one of those uh, Agatha Christie stories, uh, Witness to the Prosecution, in which he plays a British barrister. And of course, Elsa Lancaster is his nurse. You know, and she tries to give him his, uh, one of the great things they did in that movie, she tries to give him an injection. And what he does is he puts it in his cigar, which is an interesting twist. Uh, in 1939, they did uh, the guerrilla horror comedy film. Uh, now, uh, what's interesting is as you're getting into the late 30s, uh, they start a little <coughs> earlier, but you're starting to get into another genre. We talked about horror gothic stories. We talked about horror stories with uh, wild animals, sort of like uh, the King Kong. We talk about uh, horror stories with mad scientists, you know, other than the Frankenstein. Uh, the H.G. Wells uh, stories. Science fiction kind of creeps in. Now uh, we're going into talking about comedies, horror comedies. And this was one of the first ones. It was released on May 26, 1939. And uh, the film starred the Ritz Brothers and had a feature appearance by Bela Lugosi. Uh, again, after you've done so many of these gothic uh, stories, uh, you run out of storylines. So uh, a horror comedy, put a wild beast in there, and uh, maybe put a former actor who was doing Dracula in there for another bit of a creepy effect. And what you've done is you've created a whole new genre of a horror movie, a horror comedy. And what's interesting about it is, for the actors like Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, uh, this continued to keep them working. You know, like what I mentioned about Boris Karloff, I said that uh, he always felt this thing was never going to last forever. He took every opportunity that came along. And as his star rose, Lugosi's was going down. So Lugosi would take movies like this, just so that he would have an appearance. But notice he did not get top billing on the movie poster. Uh, he also did the 1940 uh, The Devil Bat. Uh, this was a fascinating film. A mad scientist is doing experiments with bats in his laboratory. And what happens is he teaches them to attack people who have wronged him uh, through his life. Now, how they attack him is interesting. Whoever created the uh, screenplay had an incredible imagination. What Lugosi, the mad scientist, does in this movie he develops an aftershave that automatically makes these devil bats, these bats of bats, attack the individual who's wearing it. So he invites uh, people he dislikes, throw in my new aftershave. You know. Gives new meaning to men in shave. Uh, the Ghostbreakers horror comedy, a 1940s one with Bob Hope. Bob Hope even gets into the uh, horror comedy genre. This one is released on June 7, 1940. Uh, the basic story is that a uh, young woman inherits a plantation and mansion on an island off the coast of uh, Cuba, and it may possibly be haunted. Uh, let's see if I can run a film on this one. Breakers Incorporated, you make them, we shake them. Bob Hope speaking. Yes, Paulette Goddard's a partner in this firm. What? You want me to send her around? <laughs> Listen, if I could tell Paulette what to do, I wouldn't send her to your house. <laughs> Sucker. You know, I never knew there were so many ghosts roaming around loose until Paulette and I got into the Ghost Breakers. Believe me, the cat in the canary was a pink tea compared to this picture. It all starts on one terrible night. Basil Rathbone must be giving a party. That's the night that Paul inherits a ghostly ancient castle off the coast, I mean the coast of Cuba. The place is filled with mummies and spooks that walk at midnight. There are murders and death warnings planned to frighten Paul and me, but we ain't frightened. I'll match you to see who faints first. Sound like 
just call his phone. Ah, that's what they're trying to make us believe. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, another classic uh, Gothic tale. And again, they would go back and forth with the Gothic uh, stories. Uh, this one also is Robert Louis Stevenson. It was released on August 12, 1941. And the basic plot is that uh, Dr. Henry Jekyll believes that uh, good and evil exists in everyone. Uh, he experiments with developing a dual personality, uh, with one being evil and the other good. Uh, so a split personality. You know, long before psychoanalysis, a uh, Gothic author like Robert Louis Stevenson was writing about a condition. Of course, in here they kind of make it worse with the use of makeup, so that the evil really looks almost sinister as well. Uh, Spencer Tracy, Ingrid Bergman, Lana Turner. Uh, that's the movie poster from the era. And uh, this is uh, two interpretations of the character. Uh, you could see uh, Mr. Hyde holding the uh, fire stick, and the other one would be the uh, Dr. Henry Jekyll, uh, actually in the process of transformation. Uh, actor Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, and the Wolfman. They become another uh, character. What they're draw drawing on is an old uh, gypsy uh, uh, folk tale from uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, someone who's bitten by a half-human, half-wolf uh, character, and you in turn become a uh, changing half-wolf, half-human character. Uh, the film was released by uh, Universal Pictures on December 12, 1941 and starred Lon Chaney Jr. Now Lon Chaney Jr. is supposedly named after the silent film actor Lon Chaney who was known as a man of a thousand faces and uh, it's interesting that his name wasn't Lon Chaney Jr. it was actually Creighton Chaney but so that they would associate him with uh, somebody who was known for horror films such as Lon Chaney, the original, his father what they did is they changed Creighton to Lon Chaney Jr. And he uh, went under that name when he made a whole series of horror films. Uh, the basic story is that uh, the main character, Larry Talbot, returns to his ancestral estate in Wales in England after learning of the death of his brother. Uh, while there, uh, he visits an antique shop and uh, strikes up a conversation with uh, the uh, lady who runs the shop, and she sells him a cane with a wolf's head on it. It's actually a werewolf. Uh, he is actually a scene from the movie where he's preparing to purchase the cane. Uh, a scene where he returns to his estate, and that would be his father, uh, and he's planning to uh, inherit uh, the estate now that his older brother has passed on. Uh, he's bitten by a werewolf. Now, interesting enough, in this film, uh, Bela Lugosi appears again, but this time he actually goes for the uh, makeup and appears as a wolf who's killed uh, by the Lon Chaney character, the Larry Talbot character, and because he's bitten by a werewolf, he turns into a werewolf. And, of course, the gypsy woman is the mother of the Bela Lugosi character, the real werewolf. Uh, and you can see uh, 
how he's uh, in a dilemma, having found out he's been bitten by a werewolf talking to the gypsy, and uh, in the other scene where he's actually uh, taking on a victim of his own. Uh, the makeup that was required to make the character took hours and hours to put together. Very similar to the Frankenstein uh, character that Boris Karloff would do. And it, it took a lot of patience and uh, perseverance uh, to develop and uh, put the makeup together for the acting that would go on on stage and in the film. Uh, Lon Chaney Jr., as I mentioned, uh, Creighton told Chaney, uh, born uh, February 10, 1906, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He dies on July 12, 1973, at age 67, of heart failure. He was a professional actor from 1931 to 1971. Uh, interesting man. Uh, 1941 also, Abbott and Costello got into the horror film comedy uh, series. They did a movie called Hold That Ghost, which was released on August 1st, 1941. And the film starred uh, the comedy team of Abbott and Costello and Joan Davis, who was a lady comedian. And the basic film, film plot was that a gas station attendant inherits a haunted tavern that may still be occupied by the living. Uh, also, uh, in 1941, uh, the East Side Kids, later uh, referred to as the Bowery Boys, uh, decided to make a uh, ghost movie as well called Spooks Run Wild. And Spooks Run Wild was released on October 24th, 1941. And uh, again, interesting enough, Bella Lugosi, you know, you bring in a horror screen actor from one of the classic movies and incorporate them into horror comedies. And this will go on throughout the 1940s. A clip from Spooks Run Wild. Let's see if we can get this up here. Sometimes the equipment's not always compatible, so let's see. All right. It worked earlier, but for some reason it's not. So we'll move on. Uh, the radio, RKO Radio Pictures, cat uh, people movies, there were two of them, people, and the curse of the cat people. Again, when Universal or one of the other studios, such as RKO Radio Pictures, had a hit with a movie, they would automatically uh, put a plan in effect to do a sequel. And uh, Simone uh, Signoret, uh, French actress, uh, this is her. She was born on April 23rd, 1911 in Marseille, France. Dies uh, February 22nd, 2005, age 94 in Paris. Uh, she was a professional movie actress between 1931 and 1973. Uh, she will always be known for the, as a horror film star in RKO Radio Pictures, cat people movies that she made during the 1940s. Uh, she was considered a classic French beauty uh, who gave cat people horror movies a seductive mood. Uh, the basic plot of uh, the cat people movies was a young Serbian woman believes she is descended from a race of people who turn into cats when angered when aroused. Interesting. Now this is another twist. Again, uh, what's interesting is an Eastern European folk tale uh, turned into a horror film. Next one, I Walked with a Zombie. I mean, I love the title, right? Uh, zombies are popular today. It seems like they're making a comeback. But I Walked with a Zombie was a popular movie during the 40s. Uh, other ones that they had, now I love the title, this was considered a horror comedy. The Boogeyman Will Get You. Isn't that a great title? You remember when you were a little kid, uh, you were told that the Boogeyman would be under your bed, right? Now, uh, 1942 horror comedy, released by Columbia Pictures Studios on October 22nd, 1942. Uh, included Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre. Now, it's another great combination of horror stars. Uh, a mad scientist uh, 
sells off an old tavern with the condition that he be allowed to remain in the basement and uh, uh, be allowed to stay there and start his experiments. Again, the mad scientist aspect. Uh, from Shelley's Frankenstein, a mad scientist evolves on so many different levels. And this is another one in the horror comedy. Uh, the 1943 version of Phantom of the Opera, <coughs> released on August 12th, 1943. What makes this film unique is it's now a different twist of a horror film. It has a horror film that's considered a musical. Now that's uh, long before the Rocky Horror Show, you know, with those kids lining up. Claude Rains has the Phantom in the 1943 stu uh, Universal Studios film, uh, which is a musical classic of the Phantom of the Opera story. And I believe this should work good. Let's see. You're going to hear us. Also color, you're getting away from the black and red and starting to get into color. Here is all you've ever wanted in entertainment in one superb show. Here is matchless story, suspenseful, terrifying, never so thrillingly presented. Here in breathtaking technicolor is superb spectacle and splendor and romance. Here is a chorus of a hundred voices, a ballet of a hundred dancers, a cast of a thousand. Starring Nelson Eddy in his most vigorous performance, lovely Susanna Foster, and Claude Rains in the most coveted role of the year as the Phantom of the Opera. My music! You've stolen it! You've stolen my music! <laughs> It takes place in the Paris Opera House, so it's a perfect scene for that. Brother and their love for a woman who lived with the dead. 
And it is also the tale of a young nurse who never believed such things could happen. Tell me that the voodoo priest could cure Mrs. Holland. Better, Doctor. Don Bala, this woman is ill. This is the ceremony of voodoo death, a ceremony that seeks the life of the woman who lives forever, who walks with the dead. And again, another interesting theme uh, is you're going with uh, voodoo, a Caribbean uh, sort of story or uh, horror basis uh, based on uh, legends of voodoo uh, out of the Caribbean. Another idea. And yet again, you can see how these horror movies are gradually going into different uh, genres of horror. Uh, my favorite, as I mentioned, The Body Snatches, which is released on uh, May 25, 1945, is based on an actual case that happened in Scotland. It was a scandal in the British papers. Uh, to give you a quick rendition of it, in that movie, of course, uh, Morris Karloff is the main character, and uh, Bella Lugosi appears in it as one of his uh, trusty henchmen. Uh, what they did in Scotland, there were two Irish immigrants, and uh, one of them uh, and uh, his wife had owned a rooming house. And uh, what happened at that time, the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, had one of the most advanced medical schools in Western Europe. And they used to have a surgical theater, you know, where the students would sit in an upper round and look down and learn how to perform surgery. Now, because it was uh, such a uh, popular school to learn uh, medicine and surgery, uh, they needed a lot of cadavers, and there weren't enough of them available. So what they did is they had to create a uh, place to uh, get the cadavers. And uh, a Dr. Knox, a real person, had uh, hired uh, two people, Burke and O'Hare, now what had happened is a lady in the rooming house, run by one of these people, had uh, died and didn't pay her rent. So what they did is they loaded her body on the cart and brought it around to the medical school. Dr. Knox was very uh, cautious. He never dealt with Burke and O'Hare. What he did was he always had one of his servants go to the door and <coughs> his ex, uh, receiving the body. They got away with it for a long time until one of the young surgeons had uh, seen a body on the table uh, and found out that uh, there was a young lady he had known the night before and had met in the tavern. Uh, she still had the ring on her head that she wore that night. And he notifies police and the two were brought to justice. So it is based on a real story. Uh, of course, H.G. Wells adapted it to a novel. These are the uh, two culprits, uh, William Burke and William O'Hare, and it happens in 1828 in Scotland. And again, they took this uh, gothic theme and made it into a movie. Uh, that's the actual Dr. Knox, who was born on September 1st, 1793, dies December 20th, 1862, uh, professor, doctor of medicine, anatomist, and zoologist. Uh, he acquired bodies from Burke and O'Hare for his medical lectures and surgical theater presentations, never convicted of wrongdoing in the Burke and O'Hare trial because he acquired the bodies through an intermediary and did not deal with them directly. Interesting. So that was a good idea for another type of horror movie. Now, The House of Horrors, released by Universal Studios in 1946, uh, the basic plot, the press sculpture decides to commit suicide, but before he does so, he meets a disfigured madman called the Creeper. Uh, the sculpture saves the Creeper from drowning and makes him a subject of his latest sculpture work, uh, which he calls his best work. Uh, when the work is rejected by art critics, the sculptor releases the Creeper on a murder spree against those who 
rejected his work. The House of Horrors is another movie. The Creeper became a popular uh, character during that era. And uh, the actor that played him is interesting. Uh, Rondo, uh, let's see, this is the man. If you can see the disfigured face, there's the sculptor making the uh, statue. And in the next one, he sends him out to murder a art critic. Uh, this is the actor, Rondo Hayden. He's born on April 22nd, 1894. Hagerstown, Maryland, dies on February 2nd, 1946, at age 51, in Hollywood, California. Cause of death was a heart attack. He was also a professional journalist and actor in the years of 1930 to 46, and worked as a sports writer for the Tampa Tribune. In World War II, he was exposed to chemicals which caused his face to grow and become extremely distorted. Uh, do you remember Andre the Giant, the wrestler? Uh, he suffered from that same disease. Also, uh, uh, Lou Fer Ferrigno, the one who was, uh, what, uh, that uh, Hulk, the Hulk actor. Uh, in Ferrigno's case, they were able to contain it. But in the case of the other two gentlemen, no. And their faces became very distorted. And. Uh, what happened in terms of Rondo, he may had planned to make three movies in the Creeper series, the uh, film studio. He dies after the first one. So the second and third never get made. Uh, but the story of the mad uh, uh, sculptor and his henchmen is an interesting story nonetheless. Uh, Spook Busters is another film with uh, now they're not called the East Side uh, Bowery Boys, they're called the Bowery Boys. Uh, another one they did, uh, which was a uh, popular uh, comedy, Scared to Death, uh, was a uh, popular movie in uh, 1947. Uh, arriving at a hospital uh, is the doctor's cousin, a European magician, uh, Bella Lugosi, of course, and his assistant, a menacing, scary little dwarf, Angelo Rizzito, who appeared in several of the horror films as well. Uh, the woman dies mysteriously uh, at the facility. It is revealed that she's uh, scared to death of foreigners, and reporters arrive at the scene trying to determine how a young woman dies from being scared to death. It is a uh, trial of murder that uh, involves all kinds of uh, participants. Uh, here are the two actors uh, that play the uh, sort of uh, bad people in the movie, Bella Lugosi and of course Angelo Rosito. Uh, Rosito, if you're interested, was born on uh, February 18, 1908 and uh, he was born in Omaha, Nebraska. He died so on September 21st, 1991, in Los Angeles, California, at age 83. Uh, he was a professional, uh, prolific American dwarf actor and voice artist in the years of 1927 to 1987. He appeared in silent films and talkies. Uh, he appeared in over 70 films, playing uh, dwarfs, midgets, monsters, villains, and aliens. So he had quite a career. Uh, 1948 uh, saw the release of the American horror comedy of uh, what Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello mean Frankenstein. And again, taking uh, a character uh, that's already been established and putting him in a comedy format, a gothic character, Frankenstein. After the third Frankenstein movie, uh, Boris Karloff will not play the role anymore. Another actor named Glenn Strange will take on the role because Karloff now is already in demand in other films. Perhaps a scene. Let's see if it goes. Ah, oh, there we go. Count Dracula sleeps in this coffin that rises every night at sunset. This is right. This is all silly stuff. This one features the ghost of Glenn Strange playing the Frankenstein.
but hilarious way. Plus the dangerous and terrifying Wolf Man, played by Lon Chaney. Plus that fiend out of a nightmare, the vampire Batman, Count Dracula, played by Bela Lugosi. Plus the most dreaded creature of them all, the Frankenstein Monster, played by Glenn Strange. Now Plus a couple of bunches of all of these into one comedy. In the spookiest last Each best one had individual record. movie points. Okay, uh, continuing with the comedy vein, Abbott and Costello uh, meet the killer, which uh, also has uh, Boris Karloff. Uh, bellboy and hotel detective discover a dead body at a resort's hotel and try to help the police solve a murder. Uh, again, by putting Karloff in there as a sinister character, uh, what would be a comedy turns into a horror comedy. Uh, at this point, we're at the end of the age, uh, the golden age of Hollywood uh, horror films that were made in the 30s and the 40s. And uh, most of the uh, definitive themes of horror movies were already used for uh, themes up to this point. And that is to say that gothic uh, horror stories, including Mary Shelley's Bram Stoker's, Robert Louis Stevenson's, and Edgar Allan Poe's, were already used as backgrounds for the uh, 30s and 40s horror film classics. Horror films of the 30s and 40s also included the horror comedy as well. Now in the 50s and 60s, you would see a different set of films dealing with monsters, aliens, creatures uh, from outer space. So again, later on, there will be a whole different change. But uh, a few horror-based films will also be remakes of the gothic classics. And some of these will be discovered uh, in weeks to come, well, if we were doing more. Uh, next in the 30s and 40s, what happens is in the 50s, they actually have a second life. What happens is uh, television studios, in the 50s, television is a new medium, uh, will have a need uh, to fill time slots on TV. So they will take these old movies from the 30s and 40s and reintroduce them to a whole new audience. And what they do is they use the uh, medium of a horror show film host to introduce it. Vampire, who appears in that Ed Wood movie, was the first horror film host. Uh, the one that we would know most likely, John Zachary, you may have heard of over the years. He did a program first out of Philadelphia and then later out of New York called Chillin Theater. Uh, he lived to be 98 years of age, and he passed away recently. Uh, as we finish up now, uh, before you leave, I have a little treat for you. Oh. What I did was, um, uh, Boris Bobby Pickett was a rock and roll star who did a uh, horror uh, record. It was a hit called The Monster Mash. And I have a film clip of John Zachary and him performing it at a Halloween party. Yeah. <laughs> This is a song that Elvis Presley, the king himself, once called the dumbest thing he ever heard. So if you're out here tonight listening, Elvis, we're still here.
that will probably conclude uh, today's show. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you had a good time. Yeah, we'll do it.